Jesus doesn't want to just be entertained in one part of the house for a brief period. His point is to be the Lord, the Dominus. That's why I like that word in, in Latin, because it sounds like dominate in English. And, oh, I don't want someone dominating me. Well, I'm sorry. He is not your little friend. He's the Dominus. He's the Lord of your life. And he wants mastery, lordship over every aspect of your life. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the Senior Publishing Director at Word on Fire. What does it mean for Jesus to become the Lord of your life? The Bible says that Jesus knocks on the door of each one of our hearts. How do we let him in? What does that look like in practice? What does it mean to open that door widely? Well, that's what we're going to be discussing today. And we are joined, as always, by Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop, good to talk with you. Welcome. Brandon, always good to see you on these transcontinental conversations we have. You're in Orlando, I'm in Santa Barbara, but <laughs> here we are together. Yeah, I feel I feel like we're finally enjoying the same type of weather. You said it was quite hot yeah. there in Santa Barbara. It's getting warm in the studio is warming up. See, our studio is super cold much of the year. And now it's, you know, pretty comfortable. So you recently paid a visit to somewhere else there in California, namely Biola University. Oh, yeah. So it's one of the premier evangelical colleges in the country. They invited you to go there and have a stage event with their president. Talk about that. How did that go? It was a great evening. Uh, Biola stands for the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. That's where that name comes from. It's, a, as you say, evangelical university. First came on my radar, my, my radar screen before I came out here to California because of our friend uh, William Lane Craig that Craig has been a visiting professor there for a long time. In fact, one of the famous debates Craig did with uh, Richard, or not Richard Dawkins, but uh, Christopher Hitchens, was at the Biola Theater. So that's how it first came on my radar screen. Well, I came out here and I met the president at a function and I discovered he and his wife follow my sermons very faithfully. And he said, would you ever be interested in coming to Biola for something? And I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to. So what we arranged was um, a wonderful dinner with the uh, faculty, a lot of the philosophy and theology faculty, and it was just delightful. I, we kind of went around the table and, you know, where'd you do your studies? What do you focus on? What, what do you like about Biola? And then I, I would engage them in different ways. And then it, the president, you're right, invited me, but I was on the stage with the uh, chair of the theology department. And we just did, for about an hour and a half, uh, questions that he had taken from students, I think, and from faculty, and he, you know, read them to me. And it was just a delightful evening, and I think we have a video of that will be coming out um, sometime soon. Yeah, I believe it should be on YouTube by the time this airs, so either search okay. for it or we'll try to include it in the show notes here as well. Bishop Barron at Biola University. Uh, Bishop, it's also that time of year again where you have the great joy and privilege of confirm confirming hundreds yeah. of young people. Uh, confirmation season, it's kicked yeah. off, hasn't it? It has, and we do it here in L.A. in a very concentrated way. Usually it's in the two months following uh, Easter. And um, I calculated the other day, doing a rough estimate, this is now my seventh confirmation season as a bishop, that I've confirmed, I, I figured, just shy of 15,000 um, people. That's just in, you know, in seven years. Confirmation season means I'm basically living in a car for two months because <laughs> in my region— unless I'm confirming right around my home here in Santa Barbara, the trips are at least 45 minutes, hour, often longer. That means that long trip, and then the liturgy is usually about an hour and 20, hour and 25 minutes long, followed by the pictures, and then usually followed by some kind of time with the, you know, the priests and the, and the pastoral staff. I love to, you know, thank those who are involved in forming these kids directly. And then there's the hour or so trip home. So doing a confirmation is much more than just, um, you know, the mass. It's about a five-hour time commitment, usually. And I've got 37 of these during this concentrated season. So, but as I've often said, I like confirmations. I really do. I, I enjoy them. Um, I don't always enjoy the long trip, but um, once I'm there and with these young people and their families, I, I always get a kick out of it. I think it was you who told me that it's a it's a known secret among bishops that maybe the most difficult part of confirmation season is the pictures that your, the pictures. your face just gets physically tired <laughs> yeah. from smiling that much. That's true. If you confirm, let's say, a hundred kids or more, uh, and you've just been through the long ceremony, and you know you've had 
the uh, confirmation kids coming up. You have the long communion lines. And then once more, everyone's got to come up. And yes, physically, it gets difficult just to smile, you know, 120 times. So yeah, that can often be the most difficult part of it. Let's shift to today's topic of discussion. Um, It's based around a talk that you recently gave to folks in your Santa Barbara region. You used the famous image, the the picture of Christ holding up a lantern and knocking Mm -hmm. on the door. It was probably most famously painted by William Holman Hunt, uh, pre-Raphaelite painter from the mid-19th century in England. Mm -hmm. Um, The image is, of course, based on that line in the third chapter of Revelation where Christ says, listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. Um, For all those listening who have the second volume of the Word on Fire Bible, uh, in Revelation chapter 3, we have that picture. We have that that image, don't we? Yeah, with with commentaries. You can study it more there. Um, But I'd like to unpack this broader idea of, of Christ knocking at the door of our heart. When you gave your talk, you referenced this great image from C.S. Lewis and maybe his most famous book, Mere Christianity, where uh, he talks about Christ coming into yourself as if you were a house and visiting every room. Say say more about that image. I've always found it very helpful. Um, what most of us do, Lewis kind of insinuates, is we entertain Jesus in the front parlor of the house once a week. So, hey, I'm religious. I go to Mass or I go to religious service, you know, once a week. So in the front of the house, in a very formal way, I can sit down with Jesus and maybe serve him tea and nice to have you. And then I'm actually kind of happy when he leaves the house, (laughs) you know, afterwards. Where Lewis's point is, well, no, he wants to be in the parlor, but he also wants to be in the kitchen. He wants to be in the recreation room. He wants to be in the living room. He wants to be in the bedroom. He wants to be in the basement. By the way, when I used basement out here in California, they all said to me, that's your Chicago background. We don't have basements out here. Same Florida, yeah. Good luck finding a basement in Florida. Because, oh, the basement's a big room in the Midwest. I mean, you might have a a finished basement. You might have your your workout space or something. So uh, the point is, Jesus doesn't want to just be entertained in one part of the house for a brief period. His point is to be the Lord, the Dominus. So I like that word in in Latin because it sounds like dominate in English. And, oh, I don't want someone dominating me. Well, I'm sorry. He is not your little friend. He's the dominus. He's the lord of your life. And he wants mastery, lordship over every aspect of your life. And I think what's – continue, Brandon, with that from Lewis. It's so good because – you know, oh, sure, Jesus comes in and, oh, yeah, some things needed some sprucing up. I, I get that. So he fixed the gutters and all that. But what, what else does Lewis say there? Because it's Yeah, I'll read the quote because I have it in front of me. Yeah. He says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can yeah. understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping right. the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But then he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. He's throwing out a new wing here or putting on an extra floor there or running up towers or making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace and he intends to come and live in it himself. It's so good. It's so good at so many levels, isn't it? It's very simple, but it's a very penetrating image. Uh, So, okay, He wants to come in and live in every room. That's challenging enough, if I take that seriously. But keep going. He doesn't want to just do that. He doesn't want to live in the house that you made, because that's way too restrictive. He wants to rebuild the whole house. As he said, it's not some little cottage that, that you think is appropriate for your life. He wants to build this great palace. He wants to make you as beautiful and rich and and fulfilled as possible. But that's gonna hurt. Uh, you know, if, if you're satisfied living in that little cottage, that's not going to be enough. I mean, because he he wants you fully alive. When Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, that's the root of Lewis's image there. But what's so good is the pain required. So he says, it's, imagine like it's a living house. It's a house that's alive. Of course, it's going to be painful when things are torn down and walls are knocked out. But what's being built here is something really beautiful and, and stunning and, 
and more attractive and, and more ample. And that's a beautiful image for the spiritual life. Why think of the Israelites, you know, when they left Egypt behind, they went through enormous pain because they, they had to let go of that old form of life. And yes, they said, oh boy, at least, you know, we had enough to eat back in Egypt and at least, you know, we were comfortable. Yeah, but you were slaves. You, you were living this, this desperately unsatisfying life. And now God wants to move you into the promised land, but it's going to cost. So the, the Lewis image hits all those dimensions of conversion and spiritual transformation. But what God's doing, he's making a great cathedral, you know, and he wants to live in there with us. That's wonderful. In that famous William Holman Hunt painting we mentioned earlier, one of the notable details is that there's no handle on the door on the outside. Mm -hmm. So the, the door can only be opened from the inside. We have to open it up and let Christ come into our house, this palace that's yeah. being renovated. And in your talk in Santa Barbara there, you mentioned six specific rooms in this house that you have to let Christ come into and become Lord of. And I thought maybe for the rest of this conversation, we just go through those those yeah. six. So these are six different ways to make Christ the Lord of your life. First is he needs to become Lord of your mind. And you quote St. Paul who says, may that same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And Paul also yeah. says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. How do we make Christ the Lord of our minds? First of all, to get over a kind of Cartesian prejudice, a modern prejudice that would say the mind is just sort of the calculating intellect. I think mind in the biblical sense is that whole manner of seeing, the whole manner of imagining, our whole way of, of engaging the world. Christ wants to become the Lord of that capacity. I've used that image as from the um, iconic tradition of St. John at the Last Supper leaning on the, on the breast of Jesus, we hear. And the way the, the iconographer writes that is John has aligned his head, his vision, to Christ's head. So he sees as Christ sees. To see with biblical eyes. I've often told preachers, that's your task because you now want to share with people a biblical vision of the world. Go beyond the mind you have. That's what metanoia literally means in Greek. So we say conversion, you know. But nous means mind, and meta, go, it means beyond. Go beyond the mind you have. Stop thinking about the world in the cramped, self-preoccupied way that you do and see the world as Christ does. That's, a, that's how he takes over your mind. The next room that Christ wants to enter after the mind is the will. He wants to become Lord of our wills. How do we allow Christ to do this? It's so hard in a way, Brandon. Maybe this one's the hardest because our will, what orders us to the good, right? And from the time we're little kids, our wills are being shaped and trained. And what a good parent does, you do that with your kids, is you teach them what they should want, right? So we, we want things because of our nature and our bodies and so on. But then the spiritual teacher is, is helping people see, you know, what you should want is this, to order the will to real goods, real objective values. It doesn't take away the will's freedom. I mean, I finally have to follow this. But a good teacher or mentor can direct the will toward the right things. Um, ultimately, toward the ultimately right thing, which is God. So that in every act of the will, I'm implicitly desiring God. So even as I get out of bed in the morning, you know, to get dressed and brush my teeth and then go get out my day and, and go to work. Well, I'm doing that because I want to make money. Why do I want that? Well, to support my family. Why do I want that? Because I love my family. I want them to flourish. Or why do you want that? And you just keep opening up the horizons that surround the will till you finally come to the good itself. What I want is, is the infinite good, the unconditioned good of God. My point there is Christ becoming Lord of your will means that. That every particular act of your will is conditioned finally by a desire for him, a desire for what he wants. So we see the world according to his vision and we desire goods according to his desire. Uh, no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me means it's not my will that matters, my will that's driving things. It's Christ's will in me. Christ living his own life in me. That's how Father Paul Murray years ago uh, explained it to me, uh, the great spiritual writer Paul Murray, where he just said, 
Christ wants to live his life in you. So desire as he desires. That's what it means when I say he's Lord of my will. You know, I've I've gotten really into the classical education movement over the last few years. You know, we're yeah. starting this new Chesterton Academy High School in Orlando, and so I've been doing a lot of reading in that in that area. And one thing that has struck me about the classical model of educating young people is how it involves the education of the will. It's yeah. teaching young people to want the good and to pursue the beautiful. Um, the way I was raised and, you know, went to public schools and, you know, progressive education. Um, if morality was taught at all, it was just a list of rules that you would follow. Maybe they're explained, maybe they're just arbitrary, but there was no training of the will to want the good. Um, how do you think we can train people to, to have our wills be aligned with Christ's wills? What does that look like as a pastor, teacher, parent? How do we train the will? Well, I, I first observed this, Brandon, that, that what you described is, is true, and I think that's the standard view today, but it's so crazy because in any area of life that we take seriously, we'd never accept that. If you want to train your kid to be a good baseball player, you order his will and his desire toward certain goods, certain ways of, of moving and reacting, uh, certain ways of, of playing the game. You want to move your kid into the world of, of music, you're going to direct his or her will in very particular ways. Why would we think in terms of morality that we wouldn't do that? Why would we say, as we tend to today, oh no, just as long as it's what you want, as long as it's, you know, you're following your own inclination and voice. Well, why in the world would I think that's right? I don't think it's right in any area of life. Oh, just, just follow your desire. As what? Name one area of life where we think that obtains. So then why wouldn't it obtain in regard to the moral and spiritual order? You know, that's why we read the scripture and we go to mass and receive the sacraments and, and look at the lives of the saints. We want to desire what they desire. We see the goods that they attained and we recognize them as objectively good, objectively valuable. And we say, I want to will in that same direction. So just as, you know, you hold up examples of great players in a sport, you have students listen to great musicians play. So we have people watch the great saints. And ultimately, all the saints reflect uh, Christ. So we look at him, and we eat his body and drink his blood, and we, we bring his life into ours so that we might um, make him Lord of the will. That's, I think, how you do it. So we're talking about the Christ who knocks on the door of our heart and wants to come in and, and make his home within us, and in particular to become the Lord of each of the rooms of the house that we are. We've talked about being becoming Lord of the mind, Lord of the will. Let's talk about Lord of the body. Um, Christianity, like Judaism, is a very embodied religion. Yeah. The body matters. How do we give our bodies to God? Well, of course, to bring everything under the aegis of love, that's the basic principle. So that applies to mind, will, public life, private life, family, body, sexuality, everything. Because that's what holiness means, ultimately. To be holy is to be perfected in love, to be conformed unto the God who is love, right? So the body, we're not Gnostics, and boy, is Gnosticism having a revival right now. Wokeism, in many ways, is a revival of Gnosticism, by which I mean the real me is buried somewhere in there, this, this real me that desires and feels and so on. And the body is just extraneous to that. The body is just there to be manipulated according to the deep down desire. Well, as I say, that's a very ancient idea. Nothing new about that. It's, it's not, you know, a, a cutting edge uh, progressivism. That's a really old idea. And from a Christian standpoint, a very tired and dangerous idea. Um, because... As you suggest, Brandon, correctly, the biblical imagination, Jewish and Christian, is that I'm, it's not the real me buried somewhere in there. Mind you how Descartes revives Gnosticism too. The cogito is this real me, and then I, he's got to find a way to bring it in conformity with the, with the physical. Uh, Kant, you know, the moral life is all about the will buried deep down within me, where the categorical imperative uh, resides. But all of that is repugnant to the Bible, that... I, I, I am my body, right? I, this is I, all of it. Mind, will, body, passion, sexuality, that's all me. There isn't a real me 
hiding underneath all of it. The upshot of that is, if Christ is the Lord of my life, that means he's Lord of my body. That means my body should be brought under the aegis of love. My body should be reverenced as a gift of God. My body should become aligned to my mind, my will, my soul. That's a really, I think, powerful idea from the ancient world, that what happens with sin is my body becomes disjointed. It's misaligned to my mind. Um, that's why the, the resurrected state we imagine is one in which there's a total conformity of soul and body, right? Uh, one of the signs of the fall is that, is that I'm, I'm out of joint, is, is my body's out of step with what I know I should be doing. So that's what it means to make Christ the Lord of your body. And under that, I think we, we talk about sexuality too. Um, our sexuality, beautiful, God-given, it's reflective of God's perfection. It's a participation in God's manner of being, but it's to be brought under the aegis of love. And when it operates at cross purposes to love, it becomes simply a vehicle for um, self-assertion or for pleasure, um, you know, in distinction from love, then something's gone haywire, something's off kilter. So that's, that's the lordship of Jesus over the whole of my body. And even, Brandon, I'll, I'll press it in the direction of, of physical fitness. Uh, if I abuse my body in different ways, you know, by overeating or by smoking or you know, mistreating my body, well, that's, that's an offense against God. That Christ doesn't want that. He wants our bodies to be healthy and to be vehicles for love. He wants them to be a source of joy for ourselves and our families, etc., so that's all, that's all very spiritual stuff, even though it has to do with the, with the material. You know, we're using this metaphor to describe Christ's lordship of coming into your house and making a home in each one of the rooms. And it, it strikes yeah. me, you just mentioned sexuality. It strikes me that this is the one area where people literally say, God it doesn't have anything to do with the bedroom. God doesn't care what you do <laughs> in the bedroom. How would you respond to that objection? Yeah, but why would he give us sexuality if he was not interested in it? I mean, why would that be an aspect of our being unless he wanted to be Lord of that too? No, that's part of that really silly idea about, um, you know, we don't legislate morality. That's all we ever legislate, right? If, you, if you're legislating, let's say you say, I, I want the speed limit to be 55. Well, why do you want that? Well, because you say it's, it's safer. Well, why do you want that? Because then it will save people from injury. It might save lives. In other words, it's a moral choice behind that legislation. Or you say, I want to increase taxes in this district. Well, why? Well, because we need money for the following social programs. Well, why do you want those? Well, because they really benefit people that need help. In other words, behind the tax increase is a moral concern. I don't care what you're interested in. Maybe it's the environment. You know, well, why do you want to protect the environment? Well, because it's beautiful and it's worth protecting and it's a gift of God, that whatever we're legislating, we're doing it for moral reasons. So to say that, that there should be no legislation of morality or that God doesn't belong in, in the bedroom or, or other aspects of life is just silly. He, he belongs in every aspect of life. Let's move to the next room, which is friendships. Christ knocks on the door of our friendships. What does it look like if Jesus becomes the Lord of a friendship? You know, I think, Brandon, one way to think about this is, this is part of metanoia, I think, changing the mind you have. As you go through your day, you go through your life, and you think, hey, that just happened to me. I, I happened to meet this guy, you know, at school, or I, I happened to run into this person. Is that the right way to think about it? Or rather, should you say, no, God put this person in my path. God's inviting me into the relationship with this person so that I might deepen my intimacy with, with Christ. Or turn it around. You know, that, that person is not someone I should be associated with. Even though I might be superficially attracted for whatever reason, you know, he's fun to be with, he's got a good sense of humor, but that person's leading me down a, a really bad road. If I become friends with him or her, I, I'm going to start behaving in ways I know I shouldn't, you know? So who's put that friend or that person in your path? You know, if there's a spiritual warfare going on, which indeed there is, um, so I mean, how do you read your life? Just, just things that happen to take place? Or, no, God is inviting me through good friendships, defined as those that lead me deeper into intimacy with, with the Lord, right? 
That, and I can name all kinds of friendships in my life that have done exactly that, that have opened me more deeply to Christ. I can name relationships that I, that I came to see, you know, that, that's not good. I, I'm, I'm being led down a path I shouldn't go down. So how do you read your friendships? Are they making me more a person of love or are they making me into a person I don't want to become? And we should apply that criterion carefully. Let's look at one final area, one final room that Christ is knocking on, and that's our professional lives. So how can Catholics working in the world, writers, business leaders, teachers, engineers, politicians, service workers, how can they allow Christ to become the Lord of their professional lives? And first, the general observation, you're hinting at it there, Brandon, is we can tend to say, oh, that's all my secular life. That's not my religious life. Religion is Sunday, and religion is my life of prayer and the Eucharist and but then what I do at the office, that's not it. That's completely wrong. I, as you know, am a great advocate of, of the Vatican II spirituality, of the universal call to holiness, and the laity's job is to sanctify the secular order. That's extraordinary, and I still think most Catholic laity don't get it or haven't even heard that teaching. Their job is to bring Christ into the secular order because they're the ones who understand the secular order. So someone who's into, let's say, finance or investment, someone into education, someone's into journalism, someone's into entertainment, someone's into business, well, they know those worlds better than I do. I, I don't know the details of how to make that more of a loving place, if I can state it kind of simply. How to bring the gospel of love and forgiveness and, and nonviolence and cooperation and justice into those arenas. Well, you know those who are in investment and in finance and banking and business, et cetera. So bring what you've taken from the altar. Bring the Christ whom you've eaten and drunk and made part of your life. Now bring him out into those arenas. Bottom line, are you making this part of life more conformed to love? Now, how do you do that? If people ask me, I'll say, well, I'm the wrong guy to ask. I can articulate the principle for you, but I would bring financiers together in one room. I'd bring private equity investors together in one room. I'd bring physicians and nurses together in one room. I'd bring lawyers together in one room and say, okay, you guys know these realms. You tell me, what's the best way to bring greater love and justice and so on to your uh, uh, arena? That's the old Catholic action model, by the way. It goes back to the 1940s and 50s. Um, I like that model, and I think it's too bad that we, uh, that we let it fall. Let's conclude with a final question. Can we allow Christ to enter our hearts just a little bit? Does he have to become Lord of every room? Can he become just Lord of some of the rooms, but not all? No, he's relentless. And that's, that's what Lewis saw in that great image. Uh, Christ is relentless because he wants us fully alive. He's not satisfied with being Lord of one aspect of our lives. He also knows, shift to the other famous Lewis image of the convoy of ships, right? If the, the convoy is moving pretty well in the same direction under the command of the admiral, but one ship is offline. What's going to happen? In short order, all the ships will get offline because it's going to bump into one, they'll bump into the other. And so it can never be right that I say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm basically there. You know, I, I got it basically together. Now, mind you, we're all sinners here. So, you know, it, this is always a work in progress. I get that. But we should never be satisfied with it. Like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm 85%, you know, good. That's, you know, I, I've often said those, those controversial texts in the Old Testament about, about putting the ban on the Amalekites, putting the ban on, you know, certain peoples. And how awful. But see, read it in this more Lewis, originistic, spiritual way. It means put the ban on all in you that's opposed to Christ. And don't settle for 80%. <laughs> or like Agag, the king of the Amalekites, like, oh yeah, I, I put the ban on 95% of the people, but I kept a little bit of livestock and, you know. Uh, no, no, no. The ban must be total. That means Christ must be the total Lord of your life.
Well, it's time now for our question from one of our listeners. Every episode, we choose one question for Bishop Barron to answer. If you have one, send it in to us at the website askbishopbarron.com. Today, we have a question from Mike in South Dakota. He's asking about a television show that lots and lots of people are talking about, and he wants to see what Bishop Barron thinks about it. So here's Mike's question. Good morning, Bishop Barron. This is Mike from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I would like to get your take or review on the show Chosen. I really enjoyed it. I would be interested in getting your thoughts. Thank you, and God bless. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I like The Chosen. I, I'm a big fan of it. I've It's, what, two seasons, Brandon, they finished? They're working on the third season now? So I've seen all the episodes. Uh, I've come to know Jonathan Rumi, the wonderful actor that plays Jesus, and he's a great guy in himself, a lot of fun to be with, and smart fellow. Um, and I've admired the show. I think they're they're well written. I love how they integrate Old Testament and New. Uh, I like the way they portray the uh, the apostles and and Jesus. I think is portrayed remarkably well by Jonathan Rumi. I, I often say to people, I can totally understand why you'd want to eat and drink with that guy because you hear all the time in the Gospels, you know, that Jesus ate and drank with sinners and he had table fellowship and and some portrayals of Jesus. He seems so ethereal that you couldn't imagine these kind of rough-and-tumble people wanting to sit down and have a, a beer with them, you know? But with Jonathan Rumi, you can. Now, at the same time, I'll say, I think they emphasize in different ways the divinity of Jesus, you know, his omniscience and his omnipotence and so on. Now, look, no one ever gets this perfectly right. The, the central challenge of any portrayal of Jesus is, can I get he's totally human and totally divine right? And I would say... No, we're probably never going to get that perfectly right. We're going to we're going to probably emphasize one over the other, or we'll get them in. So I, I cut filmmakers a little bit of slack on that. I think they do bring both dimensions of Jesus' identity out. I think they're both there. Now people can quarrel, and I've heard it's funny, Brandon. I've heard people on both sides of that divide. Some say I I, I don't like it. it's too low of a Christology. It's too much to the humanity. I've also heard. Oh, I don't like it. It's got too high of a Christology. So that's kind of a good sign, I think, that that it's got both. Um, but, you know, no filmmaker, no artist has ever gotten that perfectly right. But having said all that, I, I like The Chosen a lot. I think it's, uh, and I, I'd be happy to show it to to groups of, of you know, of like kids or seekers or anyone trying to understand Jesus better. Well, thanks for that question, Mike, and thanks to all of you for watching and listening to this episode. A reminder, if you haven't already, pick up your copy of our new Word on Fire Liturgy of the Hours booklet. You, We are about to send out the first edition, which is for June of 2022, and then we send out a new book every month after that. So sign up now, get your book. Um, we have thousands and thousands of people that have signed up to join in praying this great prayer of the church, and we'd love for you to add your voice to that chorus of praise. So you can sign up at wordonfire.org slash pray. That's where you can learn more and subscribe. Again, it's wordonfire.org slash pray. Well, thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show.